Well, welcome back to our second week in the BCS Online School. Hope you had a great weekend and that you're looking forward to learning more about our world. Let's take just a moment and pause for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your Son into this world and that through him we have redemption and adoption. We can be called your children. And this reality makes us have comfort and hope. So we give you praise and we give you honor. In his blessed name, amen. Well, did you discover that Huey P. Long was a pretty interesting politician? <laughs> yeah, Long has a very interesting uh, characteristics and very interesting delivery style and has some uh, interesting political maneuvers, if you wish. And so uh, his life is very colorful, flamboyant, and, and one that uh, attracted many people of his day and age. The website on Long says, Meanwhile, the conservative national media dismissed Long's program, lampooning Long as a hick, a buffoon, a communist, a socialist, a fascist dictator. Long kind of countered all that by saying that the national newspapers were the pawns of the wealthy Wall Street financiers who were threatened by his program. Liberal journalists alleged that a prominent Wall Street bank had hired public a public relations firm to plant negative stories about Long in the media. Long bypassed the negative press by distributing his own newspaper, the American Progress, and he spoke directly to national audiences via radio and through speaking engagements. After addressing such a crowd in Pittsburgh of about 15,000 people, a local official estimated that Long could easily win 250,000 votes in his district if he ran for president. By 1935, Long was the most photographed man in America, right behind Roosevelt and aviator Charles Lindbergh. Also in 1935, Long wrote a speculative book called My First Days in the White House, in which he gives a fictitious portrayal of how he expected the first 100 days in office to unfold. It's interesting that a political poll was taken by Roosevelt's reelection team, the first national poll of its kind, and it revealed that Long was siphoning key Democratic support from FDR's campaign. Democratic National Committee Chairman James Farley estimated that Huey P. Long could draw in about 6 million popular votes in the 1936 election. Another website reports many observers of Long and his political machinations have described him as a demagogue with an insatiable lust or power and control. And that Sinclair Lewis wrote a satirical novel called It Can't Happen Here, who had a major character who is named Berzelius Buzz Windrip, a politician with totalitarian ambitions. And many critics think that the model for this character was Huey P. Long. Another website reported that Franklin saw um, Long is sort of an enemy. In fact, he said he was, quote, one of the two most dangerous men in America, unquote. And the other particular individual was a, a General Douglas MacArthur. Roosevelt sought to undercut Long's clout by putting some of his enemies in charge of federal spending and patronage in Louisiana. And we also see that President Roosevelt ordered unproductive investigations by the Internal Revenue Service and by the FBI into Long's finances and other dealings. And as we said too, this, this website confirmed that Roosevelt did have a campaign group that saw um, Huey P. Long as a threat to the president's reelection in 1936. As you remember, he was assassinated and he lived two days longer after he was shot, and his last words were, God, don't let me die. I have so much to do. 
He's been the subject of more than 70 books, countless articles, and a documentary film. Here's a part of the speech which he delivered via radio in March of 1935. And as I read it, I want you to think about the argumentation he uses, as well as some of the rhetorical devices that you might hear. And now you have our program, none too big, none too little, but every man a king. We owe debts in America today, public and private, amounting to 252 billion. That means that every child is born with, two, with a $2,000 debt tied around his neck to hold him down before he gets started. Then on top of that, the wealth is locked in a vice owned by a few people. We propose that children should be born in a land of opportunity, guaranteed a home, food, clothes, and the other things that make for living, including the right to an education. Our plan would injure no one. It would not stop us from having millionaires. It would increase them tenfold because so many more people could make one million if they had the chance to give our plan, if they, if they gave our plan a chance. Our plan would not break up big concerns. The only difference would be that maybe 10,000 people would own a concern instead of 10 people owning it. But my friends, unless we do share our wealth, unless we limit the size of the big man so as to give something to the little man, we can never have a happy or free people. God said so. He ordered it. We have everything our people need. Too much of food, clothes, and houses. Why not let all have their fill and lie down in the ease and comfort God has given us? Why not? Because a few own everything. The masses own nothing. Well, you may not like Long, and you may not like his economic plan, but you can't deny that he struck a chord with many people who were living during the Depression. If you haven't read his plan, I encourage you to do so. And as you are reading, think about these questions as well. What kind of a relationship does he establish with the reader? How do you feel about his plan? Was it workable? Was it reasonable? And how does his plan compare with Roosevelt's eight steps that he mentioned in his second Bill of Rights? Those are some of the questions that we can look at uh, during our next Zoom conference. All right, now let's switch and look at another author who is a female this time. Her name was Meridil Lasseur. We have some biographical information about her, which is also on a PowerPoint. Lasseur's mother divorced her father when she was about 10 years old. And her mother was an activist and a teacher. Her mother then remarried, and Lasseur eventually ended up uh, growing up in the state of Minnesota. She started writing as a teen, then kind of got a bug to be an actress, and so went to New York City and to Hollywood for just maybe a year or two. I kind of ended up being a stunt girl, and then decided writing didn't look so bad after all, so she got back into writing. In 1927, one of her short stories was published, and this sort of launched her writing career. Her stories and essays and reports were about women who were suffering, and her gripping style set her apart from other writers who were also discussing social issues during this time period. Around 1926, she married Harry Rice, had two children, and then divorced him about five years later. She wrote prolifically until the end of World War II on women's rights and immigration and poverty. She even produced a novel in 1939. She had some dealings with the communists, and became blacklisted in the 50s during the Red Scare. So since she couldn't publish through her normal channels, she began to write children's books, especially biographies about famous individuals. She traveled much over the nation during the 60s, uh, interviewing others, listening to other stories as well. The feminist movement came in the 70s, and this brought new attention to her and to her earlier works which, if you will recall, were about women who were suffering. 
During the 80s, she networked extensively with other writers, artists, and activists. And she continued to write and to lecture and to give interviews and to encourage others until her death in 1996. Here are a few of her famous quotations. Walk heavily as a wheat stalk at its full time bending towards the earth, waiting for the reaper. Let your life swell downward so you become like a vase, a vessel. Let the unknown child knock and knock against you and rise like a dolphin within. Hard times ain't quit and we ain't quit. Human history is work history. The heroes of the people are work heroes. Each generation must go further than the last, or what's the use in it? Writing is primarily a sensuous and creative expression of life. Maybe that's why it's so hard. <laughs> a sensuous and creative expression of life. That creativity sometimes takes a lot of thought. Here are some comments on Lesur's writings. Ms. Branham notes, Lesur's background made her one of the many self-consciously working class writers whose narratives would become known as proletarian literature, a body of fiction and essays published throughout the 1920s and 30s by writers who came from working class backgrounds and wrote social realist stories for working class people. Another person observed, Lesur wrote treatments of both working and middle class women, their experiences of adolescence, marriage, sexuality, pregnancy, childbirth, motherhood, and widowhood that were often ahead of their time. She also wrote biographies for children and a volume of poems dealing with Native American culture. Gerald Cloud says in the letters that she wrote to a close friend and fellow writer, Lesur writes with an open and intimate tone on subjects that include politics, literature, writing, having children, her family, and her financial struggles. Lesur's interest in the working class is reflected in these letters. And this was part of a collection from the University of Delaware. Now let me give you just a small taste of Lesur and let you experience some of her gripping style. This is a domestic, this is a domestic employment bureau. Most of the women who come here are middle-aged. Some have families, some have raised their families and are now alone. Some have men who are out of work. Hard times and the man leaves to hunt for work. He doesn't find it, he drifts on. The woman probably doesn't hear from him for a long time. She expects it. She isn't surprised. She struggles alone to feed the many mouths. Sometimes she gets help from the charities. If she's clever, she can get herself a good living from the charities. If she's naturally a lick spittle, naturally a little docile and cunning. If she's proud, then she starves silently, leaving her children to find work, coming home after a day searching to wrestle with her house with her children. Some such story is written on the faces of all these women. There are young girls too, fresh from the country. Some are made brazen too soon by the city. There is a great exodus of girls from the farms into the city now. Thousands of farms have been vacated completely in Minnesota. The girls are trying to get work. The prettier ones can get jobs in the stores when there are any, or waiting on tables, but these jobs are only for the attractive and the adroit. The others, the real peasants, have a much more difficult time. A scrub woman whose hips are bent forward from stooping with hands gnarled like water-soaked branches clicks her tongue in disgust. No one saves their money, she says. A little money and these foolish young things buy a hat, a dollar for breakfast, a bright scarf. And they do. If you've ever been without money or food, something very strange happens when you get a bit of money, a kind of madness. 
you don't care. You can't remember nothing but that there is the money for which you have been suffering. Now here it is. A lust takes hold of you. You see food in the windows. In imagination, you eat hugely. You taste a thousand meals. You look in windows. Colors are brighter. You buy something to dress up in, and excitement takes hold of you. You know it's suicide, but you can't help. You can't help it. You must have food, dainty, splendid food, and a bright hat, so once again, you feel blithe, rid of that ratty, gnawing shame. Well, there you go. Try to check out the rest of her story and see what else she has to say about these women who lived through some very difficult times. I hope that that's kind of kindled a little bit of spark for you to check out her fascinating article, Women on the Breadlines. I say it's fascinating because remember, she has that very gripping style. So check her out and finish it up on page one, uh, 758, page 758 in your textbook. Well, there's another lesson. I hope you'll keep expanding your horizons and your knowledge. And until next time, may God bless you and may he protect you.